It is only natural that Dayton, being one of the world's most important industrial and manufacturing centers, should boast an active and impressive engineers' club. Today, the Engineers Club of Dayton represents the fulfilled ambitions of its founders, and more. Its growth has been set to the temple of the city's own industrial and manufacturing development. The idea of the club was born way back in 1914. Colonel E.A. Deeds and Charles Kettering, whose personalities have long been woven into the fabric of the city's own development, realized that there was a need for a meeting place for engineers. They felt that the future growth of the city's industry and business would be largely dependent on its manufacturing enterprises, which in turn must rely on engineers for their continuation and progress. Therefore, a meeting place for engineers was vital, a convenient place for younger men to associate with other more experienced engineers in varied lines of work. Their desire to fill such a need became realized in 1914, when the Engineers Club of Dayton opened its first quarters in an old residence on 2nd and Madison Street. Here were comfort and seclusion, where young and prospective engineers could gather with those of more mature years and achievement, a retreat for those men just out of school who might feel a little strange at their abrupt change from scientific surroundings to new locations of practical application. In the vault of the present club is a curious old scrapbook, containing facts about the club's beginning. Typewritten records in this book show the minutes of the first meeting on February 20th, 1914, when Colonel Deeds and Mr. Kettering invited 15 engineers representing various fields of applied engineering to attend the luncheon at the old Dayton Club. The Dayton newspapers of May 14th, 1914, carried the story. As a result of enthusiastic acceptance of the plan, the club was incorporated May 3rd, 1914, with 15 charter members. Officers were elected, with Colonel Deeds as president. Invitations to the club's opening were issued to 80 engineers to hear about the future plans and to inspect the club quarters. Guest speakers at this event were Mr. William Lodge of Lodge and Chipley Company, Cincinnati. In order to stimulate interest in club attendance, an inspiring list of speakers was provided. As a result, at the end of the second year, the membership had grown from 50 to 200, and it soon became apparent that the club would need more space. Thereupon, the sponsors conceived the idea of a larger and permanent home. A building committee, headed by Harry B. Candy, was appointed on June 27, 1916, by President Deed. This committee sought ideas by visiting engineers' clubs and similar institutions in various cities. Architects Kink and Williams were retained to plan and build the new club. Plans were approved and contract led on April 19, 1917. The new clubhouse, located at the corner of North Jefferson and Monument Avenue, was opened and dedicated on February 2, 1918. A picture tour of the club vividly reveals the thoroughness with which this institution was planned and the fine consideration given to every comfort and facility. On entering the club, the visitor steps into an impressive lobby with vistas in three directions. But first, let's look around downstairs. Entering the lobby and turning right, you step into the large billiard and meeting room. This, needless to say, is a popular haunt. Two billiard tables and three pool tables provide opportunity for relaxation. And this interesting first floor view shows the club garden through the window, as seen from the ladies' lounge in the east wing. The south wing of the first floor is given over to the main dining room and kitchen. Good food, good service, and reasonable prices are maintained here daily for members and their guests. And now up the stairs to the second floor. Here again, we are impressed by the size of the club. In the west wing is the men's lounge, more formally known as the English Room, a spacious club retreat of plain, substantial elegance. In every way, it represents a true club atmosphere of seclusion and quiet. In the south wing upstairs is a large auditorium with six seats for 400 people. The club library is also on the second floor. 
For this substantial, mellowed institution that gives so much, the club membership is ever grateful to the two men whose generous and untiring work made all of this possible, Colonel Deeds and Mr. Kettley. And here they are, as they talked over the early days one afternoon in 1935. Mr. Wright joined them. Okay. Well, Colonel, it's nice. You beat me over. Yeah. 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 That's a good meeting we had over that time. Too. Yeah, a lot different from the old ones. Than yeah. We had down the old building. Uh, how long has this club been running? Uh, you know, well, it uh, started over 20 years ago. This, this building, I think, about uh, 16 years ago. No, I was thinking we was over at the YMCA that uh, uh, the uh, initial impulse of this club was over the old YMCA. That's right. Uh, well. VG Apple and a bunch of us met yeah. over there one time on the first yeah. floor. And I think the next day we talked to you about it, we said we would take the old Harry's house over That's here. That's right. The old Harry's house is down where the new Delta building is. And it, it, remember how the flood had come through and flooded everything. It was covered with mud and they scraped it out and, and got the architects in and fixed it up. And it uh, cost more than a new building, as anything like that always does, but it was worth it. Do you remember who the first speaker was over there? No, I don't. I remember old Dr. Bashir was there. Dr. Bashir. And the bridge building. You remember the man that made the big bridges? He was there. Yeah. And then uh, we had the fellow who uh, was doctor from down at the, uh, uh, the Department of uh, Fuels uh, that uh, had invented that cracking process. Yes, yeah, he was there. And uh, then we had uh, uh, the men and <coughs> boys from General Electric. That is, uh, you hit me and Pooley. Hit me and Pooley came. Of course, we had all the conservancy engineers there all the time. I remember them, from Morgan and the rest of them came in here. And then when the club was open, uh, General Carthy, you remember? Yeah, General Carthy and, and uh, Dr. Bakeland. Dr. Bakeland, that's right. At the time, you know, they, they he was going to give us the medal for making Zach no hex Yes, he was. He was going to do that. I had that, uh, that medal hanging up in my office. Yeah, they were destroyed. <laughs> yeah, I saw it when I was up there. I thought he was there. And, uh, no. why I, there's a lot of fine fellas coming here. Yeah. And, uh, well, I think the educational side of this club is the one that's really held it together. Oh, yeah, yeah. Those of course, the link. Yeah, the social. Hello here, Orm. How are you? Fine. Well, this is nice to see you here. Yeah, yeah. After all, you started more you, things yeah. than the rest of the government. Yeah. Well, I first speakers on the, well, you know, who was it? Do you remember? Yeah. yeah. Oh, all right, fine. Well, yes, Arvo certainly did as much as that thing as anybody around here. Yeah. Well, I suppose we'd better be going in the other room yeah, we now. we have to go in there. Well, we'll go in and see yeah. that. Yeah. All yeah. right. Let's go, huh? Yeah. <clears throat> Until 1924, the club operated on an annual deficit which was always liquidated by the generous club sponsors. And in 1929, the club property was transferred by deed to the club from Messrs. Deed and Kettering. As a result, the club has since operated on its own resources. Guided to maturity by sponsors who always place interest in the engineering profession ahead of personal costs in time and money, the Engineers Club of Dayton is destined to provide continuous benefits to its membership to the city of Dayton, and to the engineering profession as a whole. <laughs>